Good afternoon, my name is James Williamson from NetWealth and welcome to our webinar series. Uh, today we've got Mark Mazzarella joining us from APN to talk about commercial property. As always, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box at the bottom and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, Mark, more than happy to answer questions, so please put any questions through and we'll go through them at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you're interested in posting to social media, please use the hashtags or appropriate details there to uh, get out into the social media space. As always, this presentation is general advice only. Uh, if you need any personal financial advice, please consult a uh, qualified practitioner. As I said, we've got Mark Mazzarella from APN Property joining us today. Uh, Mark's been with APN for three years. Uh, previously, he was at Ernest & Young uh, for five years uh, in the property uh, development team there. And by trade, he's a certified valuer, so he's more than qualified to discuss the values of per, uh, commercial property today, and it's fantastic to have him along. Thanks, Mark. Over to you. Thanks, James, and good afternoon to everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Today I'd like to cover three key topic areas as we look to dispel a few of the myths that only the wealthy can invest in commercial property. First we'll touch on a little bit about APN Property Group, who we are, what we do and how we can add value. Then we'll build up an understanding of the key differences between commercial and residential property. We'll then examine the Australian commercial property market in a little more detail. And finally, we'll consider the breadth of the benefits of broadening our property outlook to the developed Asian nations. So APN Property Group. At APN our business is a real estate investment management company and that is our focus, real estate only. And we've been doing it for more than 20 years. We take a conservative and highly disciplined approach to all of our investing. At the moment we manage almost $2.5 billion of funds with over 1.5 billion of these invested in real estate equities across Australia and Asia. The remainder of our funds under management is invested in direct property funds, both listed and unlisted. As you can see, our investment philosophy is focused on the underlying fundamentals of real estate and our mantra is property for income. Our commitment to the income benefits from commercial property coupled with a lower level of risk is reflected in our style of investments, which we first established in 1996. This is essentially focuses on owning well-managed property assets that hold long leases to strong tenants. So on to the business of today's webinar, commercial property. When most people think of commercial property, they more than likely refer to also residential. This is understandable given a large portion of Australians' wealth is tied up in their home or an investment property. Resi, as it's colloquially termed, is affectionately and widely talked about almost as a cult status in this country and it's warmly embraced. So today, let's delve into the other type of property, commercial property. And let's explore the differences between commercial and residential in a bit more detail and try and debunk a few of the myths that only the wealthy can indeed invest in this asset class. While both commercial and resi are bricks and mortar, similarities largely end there. Just to clarify what I mean when referring to commercial property, these types of properties range from retail shopping centres, office buildings, industrial parks, health and aged care facilities, as well as storage facilities, childcare centres and even petrol stations. So on this chart here we can see the major differences between the two types of property classes from the perspective of a return. At the highest level, commercial property is first and foremost considered to be a high yield, low growth investment as we can see from these bars here. Residential property on the other hand is generally considered a lower yielding investment but with higher growth. What drives commercial property's high yield profile ultimately boils down to the lease contract. 
These lease contracts lock in rental payments for generally long periods of time, providing a level of protection from the normal and economic business cycles. Indeed, these are a defining feature of commercial properties. So in a bit more detail on a few of these differences, and aside from the large gulf in the difference between the effective cash yields on offer, 2 to 3 per cent per annum for residential versus 5 to 7 for commercial, pro uh, commercial property at a high level, let's take a quick dive into some of the features. Um, in commercial property, tenants are generally locked in to pay rent on their premises for long periods of time. It's not uncommon to get 5 to 10 to 15 year initial lease terms. Indeed, for a lot of these corporates, if there's no rent, there's no premises and no business. So regardless of the vagaries of business and broader economic conditions, leases provide a level of protection for investors because a business simply needs to occupy their space. Compare this to residential property where leases are generally 6 to 12 months. A further level of protection for investors is the type of tenants, especially in the case of listed property, usually providing a high quality covenant. Tenants can also include typically multinational corporations, ASX listed tenants, indeed government departments providing the highest level of covenant quality. These tenants have generally signed up for long term uh, periods of time compared to residential property where the tenants are actually individuals. Also, in commercial property there's balanced legislation between tenants and landlords, unlike in residential property where it's definitely weighted by the Residential Tenancies Act to favour the residential tenant. Property costs is another significant one. Most commercial leases will provide for outgoings to be paid by the tenant and typically include council rates, water rates, insurance, strata lead, levies and other property management fees. Tenants are also required to make good at the end of a lease, so that can include repainting walls, ripping up and replacing worn carpet, etc. Whereas these isn't, aren't typically the case for a residential property. The majority of costs in a commercial lease are therefore generally borne by the tenant, whereas in residential, these are largely borne by the landlord, eating into returns. In Australia, we have the benefit of the vast majority of commercial leases also containing a ratchet clause. So that means that the rent can't fall during the lease term. Generally, rent review clauses are aligned to CPI or fixed on a per annum basis, providing a natural hedge against inflation as well. Residential leases, by contrast, are determined by local market conditions and can go up or down. So where does this all intersect? Commercial property delivers predictable, repeatable and sustainable cash flow underpinned by the lease contract for the underlying properties. This can be seen and considered to be not too dissimilar from fixed interest, which, had, which adds a great level of defensiveness and diversification for an investment portfolio. So with all that said, and it might be all well and good to talk about commercial property and the benefits of an investment in this asset class, but the reality is that few people have deep enough pockets, expertise, or the time required to purchase a towering skyscraper or a Westfield shopping centre. And even if you were fortunate enough to afford to purchase these types of assets, you'd be burdened by a lack of diversification and a lack of liquidity. You can't exactly sell part floors of a retail shopping centre, can you? Real estate investment trusts, or REITs however, also formerly known as listed property trusts, provide an ideal way for investors to access some of the highest quality professionally managed real estate in Australia. REITs offer the added benefit of low amounts of upfront capital, full liquidity because the REITs are listed on the stock exchange and traded, meaning you can top up or dial down your exposure at any given time, and of course diversification. You've got exposure to hundreds of properties, tenants and locations. Let's take a bit more of a look at some of the features of REITs. In the context of REIT investment vehicles, you can see on this slide here that they are characterised by high yields. Relative to residential returns and other investments, REITs generally deliver a high yield. 
On our numbers for the financial year of 18, the market yield across the A-rate market is circa 5.5%, so I think we'd agree that that's uh, a decent level compared to current bond yields and also domestic cash rates. Capital growth. Growth is generally consistent with CPI and GDP over the medium to long term. Tax effectiveness. Part of the income received may be tax advantaged from a REIT investment. There's also comparatively low costs driven by the economies of scale that come with the management of a REIT platform owning multiple properties. There's a low entry threshold. Small capital investment is required compared to large capital outlays in the case of an individual commercial property. There's expertise in the management teams which are often highly specialised across the REIT sector. Liquidity. As I mentioned, you can dial up or down your investment at any time. REITs trade just like shares on the stock exchange. And diversification. Mentioned previously, exposure to a wide range of, of assets across a heap of different locations. As an example, as at today, the APNA REIT fund held an exposure to approximately 2,500 individual properties. So I think it's important that a key takeaway from today's webinar is a focus on the underlying driver of value for any commercial property, and that's the lease contract. So as I mentioned before, there's a heap of uh, differences between commercial and residential property. The key one is the dynamics of the underlying lease contract. As an anecdotal example, in a commercial scenario, tenants are locked in to pay the rent on their premises for long periods of time. And as I mentioned, if there's no lease, there's no business. So if you've got CBA as an example as your tenant, it doesn't matter what their profit is over the time of the lease or the duration, regardless of whether the profits rise, fall, they must pay the landlord the contracted lease rent. It's also important to appreciate that as a landlord, you're at the top of the credit waterfall queue. So, as another example, if CBA, as the tenant of your building, decide to reduce their own dividend, they can only do so after paying your rent. Again, and as I mentioned earlier, predictable, sustainable and repeatable cash flows underpinned by commercial lease contracts are what any investment in commercial property is all about. Now this slide here shows some returns data across various asset classes globally. So we've got the A-REIT sector, large cap stocks, corporate bonds. You're not expected to read the details on this slide, but basically it shows the performance of these sectors over the last 16 years. Shaded in red is the A-REIT sector. So as we can see, A-REITs have been in the top three performers for 10 of these years. Not a bad feat. On average, they've delivered an impressive 9.5% average total return over this period. Indeed, over the 35-year period of returns data available, A-REITs have only had three negative years of performance. So we've discussed commercial property broadly and the REIT structure and benefits and the very types of commercial properties, but let's focus on the two most prolific categories, retail and office property. The retail and office market in Australia makes up over 80% of the national commercial property market. Indeed, both of these sectors are considered to be in good shape with strong fundamentals at the current time. Retail as an asset class, shopping centres, has the highest barrier to entry of the two sectors. By this we mean that you can't simply build another Chadston or High Point shopping centre within close proximity to these monolithic assets to take market share. These assets are also held and managed by the best or what are considered to be the best management teams in the country. And the assets show strong fundamentals with very low vacancy, indeed less than 1% across such portfolios as those managed by Centre Group, Westfield and Vicinity Centres. There's good growth in retail rents and international retailers continue to enter the domestic economy. We in fact believe that the sector is undervalued at the current time. Flagship assets, much like the Chadston Shopping Centre and High Point I just mentioned, 
seldom change hands. That means there aren't, isn't an active transaction market or bead for valuations. For those who may be th thinking that online shopping will replace bricks and mortar, the rate of online shopping in Australia has in fact dropped over recent years. It's currently at around 7% of total retailer spend, but if you can recall, and I'm sure we all can when we were madly buying things online, this only increased to about 8.5% when the Aussie dollar was at its highest point against the US dollar. It's also important to note that domestic retailers dominate the online retail market with about an 80% share of all sales. In the office sector, Sydney's been one of the standout performers globally and indeed in the country. Over the last 12 months, it's exhibited almost 17.6% rental growth, which is outstanding and partially a function of the supply and demand within this market. There has been an increase in the number of tech companies setting up or expanding into the CBD as well. And even with the large development of Barangaroo that maybe some of us have heard about or seen, it's added a heap of capacity to this market, but it's been actively absorbed with the overall vacancy rate staying relatively low and definitely under the equilibrium level which is around 6% currently. The Melbourne market, offices, office vacancy has been falling, providing some impetus for rental growth as well. But on the flip side, the Brisbane and Perth markets are struggling with an oversupply, possibly or largely due, due to the ease with which these office buildings can be, be developed, unlike retail. It's probably important but I also note that at the bottom of that slide, you can see that APN's forecast dividend yield for the APN ARE fund for the FY18 period is actually 6.15%, an increase on this time the previous year, um, showing that there is a heap of value in the sector. We obviously focus on the highest quality assets within the two property classes when constructing our core portfolio. But our index unaware active style allows us to consider investments with strong fundamental value. So let's take a quick look at a couple of our investment case studies. Here are two we believe highlight key aspects of our active investment style and our unaware positioning relative to the index. The first is GPT Metro Office Fund. We initiated this investment in IPO with a substantial holding of around 7% of all of the issued units. I think we were first attracted to the trust by its focus on deriving a passive, high quality rental income, which is essentially what we aim to deliver our own clients in our own funds. It had a metropolitan office mandate and the quality of its external manager, GPT, is exceptional. We maintained our initial investment and ultimately sold out when the GPT Metro Fund was taken over by Growth Point crystallising a total return of around 38% over our holding period. Second investment that's worth noting is that in the Viva Energy REIT. This REIT owns a portfolio of around 400 petrol stations, Shell branded, across the country. Initially, we didn't elect to take up an investment in this vehicle, despite it fitting perfectly in line with our fund's mandate, which is high relative income from a quality lease government, but due to pricing, we passed. Our funds ultimately did, though, take a position in the REIT when it traded below its issue price. And in June this year, Viva traded at almost $2.46. So quickly, let's take a look at the outlook for A-REIT investors. If we have a look at this slide, you'll see that the fundamentals are definitely strong with further NTA growth anticipated driven by asset level fundamentals and pricing. GDP growth, which is a total return type um, requirement, in addition to the distribution return, is anticipated to be steady at around 2.5%, which is okay for property. High yields, there's a healthy spread to market yields and the risk free rate of almost 250 basis point actually as we stand here today. So there's a heap of headroom there for valuation um, increase. Capital growth, our valuations imply capital upside on current A-REIT pricing with the sector trading at a discount to our own assessment of what the fair value of all of these REITs are. 
it's around 15%. A-REITs are defensive, strong balance sheets, and they've got conservative gearing at the current time. As an example, average gearing across the A-REIT sector is around 30% at the moment, but before the GFC, this was above 50%. And then I guess to round out, total return outlook for the next 12 months of 9%. So total return distribution plus capital growth um, driven by the CPI type level. So let's turn our attention further north, I guess, and let's uh, have a look at a region that represents remarkable growth prospects and uh, prospects for real estate investors in our view, and that's the developed countries of Asia, primarily Hong Kong, Singapore and Japan. But firstly, let's have a look at why Asia and the big picture growth prospects. Diversification, there's over 150 A-REITs and this is growing. The A-REITs globally have developed into a mature real estate investment vehicle over the last 50 years, but in Asia, less so. Indeed, the first REIT was incorporated in the early 2000s. But as I mentioned today, there's over 150 and the market makes up over 13% of the global value. Asian REITs have provided investors with an attractive way to achieve their listed real estate exposure via accessing the real estate investment performance of high quality commercial real estate assets held in Asia. These deliver the benefits of secure cash flows backed by long term leases as well as the potential for capital growth, also supported by above average economic growth as we'll see shortly. Asian REITs have also been an important diversification tool for investors in REITs that have traditionally just focused on their home market, so this home bias effect. Pleasingly, in order to attract further institutional capital globally, the A REITs, sorry, the REITs in Asia actually exhibit stronger governance metrics than the more established peers throughout Australia, Europe and the US. Indeed, increasingly sophisticated REIT governance structures are currently evident within the main markets of Hong Kong, Singapore and Japan, which have rigorous REIT codes. So a slide here really illustrating why Asia remains the engine for global growth and why this is anticipated to continue into the medium term. You can see there that India, China and the ASEAN five nations all exhibiting higher economic growth on a GDP growth basis than the more developed Australia, US, Euro and Japan regions. And that's no surprise. And as real estate investors, from our perspective, economic growth creates strong underlying occupancy demand for the high quality commercial buildings we as income focused investors would like to own. So we're definitely attracted to this regional opportunity set. Indeed, we mentioned the relative infancy of the sector being only around two decades. But from this graph here, we can see the investable universe from Asian rates has increased substantially over this period. But perhaps most glaringly is the absence of the two largest markets within this region being India and China. So imagine a situation in years time where those two markets have an active REIT um, product which can add to this level of market which is around 200 to 300 billion dollars currently. It's worth noting that India and China are currently working to implement REIT legislation and a REIT framework that will definitely allow this to take place over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So where does the rubber hit the road, I suppose? And as a fund manager investing in Asian rates as well as Australian rates, this slide here shows the performance of our Asian and Australian rates and how they stack up over the last five years on a risk and return um, basis compared to general Australian equities and Asian rates. What you can see is that the quadrant in the top left-hand corner, the grey one, is where both of our funds are and really where you want to be as an investor and that is earning a relatively high return with lower risk than other opportunities. You can see that the Asian REIT fund and the APNA REIT fund are both located here and, earn a lot and have delivered a lower risk compared to equities 
with a higher relative return. All of this though bearing in mind that income is the key objective of our funds, we're not chasing capital growth and as commercial property investors we don't believe this should be the focus, it should be on sustainable income that is also growing. So as, as we went through for, a, for the Australian example, let's quickly touch on a couple of our investment case studies um, from with it in our Asian REIT fund. The first is Fraser's Centrepoint Trust or FCT, which currently owns a portfolio of six quality suburban shopping malls in Singapore. They've got a combined value of over two and a half billion Singapore dollars. The trust is focused on regular and stable distribution to unit holders. So that's why we've instituted this investment overweight in this fund. The malls enjoy a very captive market with good connectivity to public transport and a high occupancy. And this underpins the resilience and stability of the property income that's earned by this trust. As an example, to highlight the quality and high patronage to these assets. Last year alone, there are in excess of 100 million individual visits to just these six assets. On the distribution side, it's also grown steadily since the REIT formulated in 2007. And it's grown by an average of 7% per year over the 10 year period that's followed. Another example is that of Japan Excellent, which is a REIT listed on the Japan Stock Exchange and it holds a portfolio of office buildings throughout Tokyo. Now this investment leverages our positive view on the Tokyo office market and the strong activity within this city and market generally. Certainly I guess when some investors think about Japan they immediately think of low growth and low inflation. Well that may indeed be the case at a national accounts level. Economic activity within the Tokyo prefecture is definitely robust at the moment. Indeed, Tokyo is the largest office, office market in the world and has one of the tightest vacancy in terms of uh, global peers, which is at around 4 or 4%. So only 4% of stock within this, the largest office market in the world is available. So this is a positive for rental growth and which we can see through with this investment in particular, and it's come through in the form of strong distribution increases of around 6% per annum. So I guess delving into things a bit more um, at a high level here, what kind of returns are on offer? I guess we've heard commercial property is it's very hard, is about delivering regular and sustainable consistent income. So for investors in real terms, I've included here the current running yields on offer by both our APNA REIT fund and APN Asian REIT funds at 6.4 and 6.5 per cent per annum respectively. I'm sure you can agree that these are attractive, especially in today's low interest rate environment. I guess if a reliable, relatively high monthly income stream is a top priority for an investor, an investment in commercial property via a property securities fund like our own, APN Asian REIT Fund and APN A REIT Fund is certainly worth considering. Just to wrap up, here's a couple of key summary points that I guess would be good to leave you with as to why commercial property enhances your investment portfolio. Commercial property is first and foremost an investment in an income stream. Capital growth will follow and is generally aligned to CPR growth. Secondly, Commercial property by nature is a defensive asset class. This is due to the generally long leased contracts that are in place. So that regardless of business or economic fluctuations, tenants are committed to pay rent over the duration of the lease term, providing a level of protection. Further protection is provided by the quality of tenants, high credit ratings, ASX listed, strong going concern businesses. Also, because of rent ratchets, rental income streams are protected to a degree also by fixed annual increases generally to CPI or at a fixed rate. Commercial property delivers predictable, repeatable and sustainable cash flow and I hope if you're going to leave this webinar with one message it's exactly that. 
Another key takeaway, I guess, is to give you an idea of the kinds of returns from a total return perspective that are on offer. Over the next 12 months, we'd expect circa 9% total return with the lion's share of that of around 6 to 7% made up from income distributions. So that's the end of the presentation today. Happy to take some questions, James. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was uh, very illuminating discussion, uh, the principles you outlined there of APN's group and investing into commercial property. Uh, I think most of our listeners would have got something from that. I certainly know I did. Um, the information, as always, is general. I'll just leave the disclaimer up there. So there's been a couple of questions come through, which I'm just getting to, uh, from a few clients that have come through here. Uh, so one of them, Mark, was just about the, you know, I guess, I think it would be your headline product, the uh, APN fund listed on the ASX code APD, is it? Um, yeah, so that's APN Property Group APD, which is the listed company uh, fund manager that is the responsible entity for our fund. So okay. that isn't actually the APN ARE fund. That's not the ARE? Okay, that's the company behind the ARE. It is, okay. that's right. All right, thanks for clarifying but that. But uh, I'll just add that the APN A-REIT Fund and Asian REIT Fund are available on the ASX through the M Fund platform. Yeah, and through the Net Wealth uh, platform as well, I think, just through the conventional uh, managed funds. So we've got both of those funds available to investors. Uh, with with regards to uh, your the portfolio, of the uh, main ARE fund, not the the Asian one, the the other the other fund. Does that cover? Does that have investments in America and Europe as well? The only investments uh, on a look through basis into those markets are through stocks such as Westfield mm -hmm. and Goodman Group. Okay. So Westfield, um, going back a couple of years, Westfield split out their Australian and global operations into a domestic. REIT, which is Centre Group. So Centre Group is the code SCG, and that's probably our largest holding in our fund, and that owns okay. all of the Westfield branded shopping centres here in Australia. The Westfield that owns the assets in America uh, and Europe is Westfield Corporation, and that's also listed on the ASX and held by our fund, but we only hold that at a relatively small weight. So in an example, the market index will hold 17 odd percent in Westfield, whereas our funds will hold around four. Okay. Okay. That's um, quite a differentiation right. point. Yeah. Similarly with Goodman Group, they've got global operations with very limited exposure to Australia. I think it's less than 50 percent. Okay. And we will own only a smaller uh, percentage of that in okay. our portfolio uh, for the very reasons that I probably highlighted that you get a lot less transparency to the underlying income mm -hmm. and our investors are after strong, sustainable, defensive rental earnings and that comes from Australia in our view. Okay, okay. So there's not a huge amount of exposure to the US or Europe markets. No, that's right. Okay, that's, uh, thanks for that question there from uh, Crack, I think it was. Thank you. Another query that's come through was just on the overall view of LVRs at the minute um, in the office and retail space. What, what's the are they valued in your view relatively expensively compared to historical levels? Yeah, look, sure. LVR loan to value ratio. I guess we can have a chat about gearing. Um, certainly, in my time, gearing in the sector has been relatively low, and that's pro pro. Uh, post the GFC period where gearing and leverage was the flavour of the month, um, mm -hmm. certainly greater than 50% in a lot of instances, but now um, gearing in the sector is on a lot lower, more sustainable level. Okay. Um, it's also probably worth noting that pre-GFC it wouldn't be uncommon for one rate with billions of dollars in debt to only have one source of funds, so one bank okay. um, with short-term debt, but now... Very the banks have got uh, yeah, a much more diversified debt book um, and longer tenor, generally providing greater security and greater certainty of underlying distribution income. Okay. Do you know roughly, Mark, what the 
uh, LVR, loan to value ratio, is of the uh, investment you have in the APA? Yeah, fund? sure. Look, the A-REIT fund at the moment has a, a gearing ratio on a look-through basis to the to the REITs that we own of around 29 to 30 percent. Okay. So you would view that as manageable or, or yeah, low? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely manageable. Yeah, okay. And where do you, what's the view from APN on interest rates? Well, look, generally. I think the house view generally is that we're definitely in a lower for longer environment. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of rhetoric around the US raising rates, even Canada this week, mm -hmm. um, whether the Australian market could sustain an increase in interest rates is probably um, less likely mm -hmm. than likely. Certainly the rhetoric from the RBA is that um, growth is targeted to be in their band of 2 to 3% mm -hmm. on a GDP growth mm -hmm. basis, um, but it's been consistently revised mm -hmm. below that. Below, yeah. So I think um, definitely our house view is that we're in a subdued interest rate environment at the moment. Okay. Um, how long that lasts is the million dollar question, that's it. Okay, so thanks for answering that. Uh, for Joe, who sent that question in, Mark. Uh, thanks, Joe Ryan, there on the questions about loan-to-value ratios. Uh, another query, I guess, would be on the retail uh, side of things. A couple of past presenters have focused on Amazon mm -hmm. uh, and how it's going to completely destroy Australian retail. What is your view on, on Amazon and, I guess, more generally, overseas low-cut price, uh, cut price, distributors of goods that come to Australia perhaps or have an online presence only. What do you think the effect of those will be on the retail? Yeah, look, I think a high quality shopping centre will always have a place in the Australian market. If anything, the types of shopping centres and indeed retailers that are negatively impacted by offshore retail groups coming into Australia fighting for their market share and eating into their mark margins will be the lower quality ones and in lower quality centres. Okay, yep. So that's very much the way that we think about structuring our portfolio is definitely quality um, over the uh, retail sector side. In terms of Amazon, I guess we've probably had the biggest, um, the biggest uh, positive for real estate generally over the last couple of weeks um, at the hand of Amazon when they went out and purchased the Whole Foods mm -hmm. uh, business network for you know, 16 odd billion dollars just so they could get a, a larger retail footprint. Now, I think that's quite prescient from a retail, mm -hmm. um, certainly property yeah. perspective because I think in the US, Amazon have, um, have really wanted to grow their fresh food offer and the only way you can really do that is if you've got a physical presence. So I think that's a mm -hmm. that's a, a, a key um, indicator of the importance of physical space. Yeah, um, okay. Still one, need that. That's right. Footprint. One thing that retailers in Australia have been slow to do, but are starting to do more so now, is building out their omni-channel network. So that means that they've got multiple distribution channels. They need a physical retail mm -hmm. presence, but they also need an online presence okay. um, and a distribution presence. Yeah. So a retailer like Peter Alexander, for example, is probably one of the most successful in this area okay. in our country um, and has each of those legs squared away. Yeah. So the online point and click buying and then collect in the store or try on in the store. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. You can't have one without the other and we continue to, to believe that. For people out there who don't know who Peter Alexander is, it's a, uh, what would you call it, a pyjama store just about. Um, sells sells colourful ladies' undergarments, to put it more politely perhaps. Um, so perhaps if there's uh, listeners out there, you could stop by and, and check it out. Um, but it is, yeah, a very expensive store and they do have a specific niche in probably women under the age of 40 typically. So they do have very um, good stores. Another query that's come through uh, was just on the, uh, even though this is on commercial property, uh, Mark, your views on the retail property or, I'm um, sorry, residential property uh, what's your take on that at the moment, residential property? Yeah, sure. Well, as I, I mentioned in the uh, presentation, it's everywhere you look. It's almost a religion in this country, rightly or wrongly. I'd suggest probably wrongly. <laughs> um, 
but residential property, I think we've seen a bit of a, a disconnect between the eastern seaboard key markets of Melbourne and, uh, of course, Sydney in terms of their price growth over the last 12 to 24 months. But then you'll have a look at some cities like Brisbane and Perth where prices have been going backwards. Um, I was in Perth a couple of months ago on an asset tour meeting up with a couple of residential developers and they're talking about a backlog of, uh, of, of supply that needs to be worked through in the tens of thousands of dwellings before they see price growth again. So it's definitely concentrated into Sydney and Melbourne in terms of the price growth. I guess my view is personally that uh, I can't see how things keep going the way they're going from an affordability perspective. Um, we're in a lower for longer interest rate environment, certainly from an RBA cash rate perspective, but unilateral or bilateral increases at the um, actual lender level in interest rates will probably come through and also some APRA regulatory um, uh, restrictions, which are probably long overdue and, and really a good thing for stability in the market. So I wouldn't be surprised if um, at a headline level residential prices keep tracking sideways for some time. Okay. Okay. Do, do has APN ever looked at having a, a residential property REIT at all, or we'll look a product along those lines? It's interesting that you mention that, James. I spent some time working in Singapore, and I note that also in the US and Europe, that residential property uh, is another REIT asset class. So mm -hmm. there'll be some dedicated REITs that just own residential apartments. So it's called multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that hasn't occurred in Australia is from a tax perspective as well as a returns perspective. So as I mentioned, the yields on offer are a lot lower for mm -hmm. residential. Okay. Um, but if that ever changes, I wouldn't be surprised if there is an institutionalised residential asset class. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously less protection from a landlord's perspective mm -hmm. um, and lesser covenant quality and certainty with the lease term. But in markets like Europe, it's not uncommon to get a five-year residential lease. So okay. that could be something that, that comes onto the Australian market, certainly in Melbourne and Sydney down the track. But nothing in the short term? Nothing in the short system. term. There's some uh, larger private owners that are looking at a rent to um, a rental model, built to rent model, but nothing in the rate space. Okay. And what would you say, Mark, would be the greatest uh, threat, I guess, to the returns of a, of a, of a product like your APN? Uh, a rate fund that you do you run? Look, probably at a simple level, when you unpack the types of REITs that we own, they own high quality assets. Uh, we aim to generate a low volatility in our returns, but most importantly, we aim to provide a uh, strong distribution yield that's above the sector by at least 110%. <laughs> So then that makes us think about what's the risk to the underlying earnings at a property level mm -hmm. um, and at a rate level okay. in particular. So one of the uh, top risks would probably be interest rates given interest costs, uh, the highest cost um, in cost for any rate. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're buoyed by the fact that in recent years, REITs have done a heap of work around getting their debt books uh, cleaned up and in a almost fortified position. So mm -hmm. they might have longer debt, lower debt um, to more varied sources, but they've also got hedges in place. So that is, they've taken out agreements that lock in an interest rate for a period of time. And I think the average hedge across the A-rate sector might be around 70%. So mm -hmm. even if interest rates increase tomorrow, mm -hmm. you'd only feel it for 30% of okay. the debt book. But if I had to point to one risk, it would be rising interest rates. Rising interest rates, okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, obviously, interest is, is another major component. Of there's also uh, there's also it's important to note that with rising interest rates, it also implies that there's rising economic activity. Yeah. So when that occurs, yeah. tenants are in a position to pay higher rents. Mm -hmm. and there's evidence to suggest that they rents outperform in a in a rising interest yeah. rate environment as well. So it's okay. a bit of an all weather investment. Okay. So yeah, I guess that's important to remember when looking at commercial property. It is. Sort of people need to tweak their, their thinking processes a bit a little bit there compared to if they're thinking of their, themselves in a, in a mortgage situation. Are uh, you buying a, a property with a business behind it? So uh, there's a few other questions that we might just take offline um, for.
for you there, Mark. Uh, a few specific sure. queries about uh, products uh, that you've got coming up from APN. Uh, I think you're launching a a, uh, a a read from APN on the fuel fuel stations. Is yeah, that we right? are. That's the uh, the direct part of the business of which I'm not a part. Okay. So I work in the securities business, which is that's okay. Much we won't put the hard word on you about that. If there's any few questions on that have come through, I'd probably just refer to the APN website. That would be the place to go uh, to, to get more information on that. Uh, but I think that's all the questions we've got through to today, for today. So again, Mark, thanks for coming in. It was terrific. If anyone has any other queries or is interested in investing, you can, of course, do that through the NetWealth products uh, or contact your financial advisor and they'll be able to assist you in that as well. There's lots more information on our website and this slide and recording will be sent out to everyone uh, in the next few days. Thanks again. Look forward to seeing you next time.